This lecture on atrial septal defect has been brought to you by USMLE Clinic. Children with small to moderate sized defects are usually asymptomatic. Even moderate to large sized defects may not present overtly until adulthood. Rarely, very large defects may result in symptoms early in life related to pulmonary edema and high output cardiac failure. If a lesion with a significant degree of shunting goes unrecognized, Chronic pulmonary overcirculation results in damage to the pulmonary vasculature over several decades. Adult patients may initially report dyspnea, fatigue, or a mild reduction in functional capacity. Some may not appreciate any symptoms at all, only to discover an improvement in exercise tolerance following closure of an incidentally detected defect. Atrial dilation can result in atrial fibrillation or flutter, manifesting as palpitations. These arrhythmias in turn can result in paradoxical embolization such as a stroke or transient ischemic attack. Even though the shunt is predominantly left to right, a transient flow reversal, such as a current of valsalva maneuver, may allow for a thrombus to be dislodged and pass through the defect and onwards into the systemic circulation. Cyanosis can develop in patients with pulmonary hypertension and a reversal of flow through the defect, also known as Eisenmenger syndrome. More advanced stages of the disease tend to occur sooner in patients living at a high altitude due to chronic environmental hypoxemia. A very suggestive combination of findings on the physical examination includes an ejection systolic murmur over the pulmonic area and fixed splitting of the second heart sound. That is, the second heart sound is widely split and does not exhibit any noticeable variation with respiration. Large defects may manifest as a hyperdynamic precordium with a right ventricular heave. There may also be signs of congestive heart failure, such as tachypnea, crackles, and hepatomegaly. In adult patients, the pulse may be irregular due to the presence of atrial fibrillation. Note that fixed splitting of the second heart sound is not pathognomonic of an atrial septal defect. As well, the defect itself does not usually produce a loud murmur. The systolic flow murmur that may accompany the defect is due to an increased volume of blood passing through the right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonic valve. If there is a large left-to-right shunt, turbulent flow across the tricuspid valve may also result in a mid-diastolic rumble. Echocardiography is the preferred test for establishing the diagnosis. It will show flow between the atria, allow for assessment of the anatomy, and help in the detection of associated cardiac anomalies. Small secundum type defects, those that are 3 mm or smaller, usually close spontaneously, whereas primum and sinus venosus defects typically do not. ECG and chest x-ray changes are not needed to make the diagnosis. However, there may be several abnormalities present that are worth mentioning. The ECG may reveal evidence of right atrial enlargement right ventricular enlargement, and a minor right ventricular conduction delay. In regards to axis deviation, the abnormalities present depend on the type of defect. With the more common type, ostium secundum, there may be right axis deviation, whereas with ostium primum, the type that is common in Down syndrome, there may be left axis deviation with left anterior fascicular block. In small to moderate sized defects, the chest x-ray will usually demonstrate a normal cardiac silhouette. With larger defects and greater degrees of shunting, there may be several abnormal findings present. A widened heart silhouette can occur due to a dilated right heart, and the increased pulmonary blood flow can result in prominent pulmonary vascular markings and an enlarged pulmonary artery. On the lateral x-ray, hypertrophy and anterior protrusion of the right ventricle can result in a broad area of contact between the anterior wall of the heart and the sternum. Closure is generally not required for a small defect in an asymptomatic patient. However, you should counsel the patient or the parent of the patient to report any symptoms and to advise them not to participate in certain activities such as scuba diving. Closure of the defect should be offered to patients without pulmonary hypertension who are symptomatic, have sustained a paradoxical embolism, or have evidence of right ventricular overload. Secundum type defects can be closed via catheter intervention if anatomic characteristics are appropriate. Primum and sinus venosus defects, however, usually require surgical closure. Prophylactic antibiotic therapy is indicated for all patients during relevant procedures, such as dental work or bronchoscopy, for at least six months following closure of the defect. Patients who have received an atrial septal occlusion device should also receive six months of antiplatelet therapy.